All right. Had to put new batteries in it this morning. But anyway, um, and I was using the symbolism of, and the typology of trumpets to teach typology, to show you that you're reading 1 Thessalonians 4, and it's telling you what is going to happen when the Lord descends from heaven. There's going to be a shout, there's going to be the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain. And you have the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So you got two verses there, two witnesses, telling you that at the translation of the saints, from earth to new bodies to heaven, um, there are things that accompany that. And the common thing between 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 is the fact that there's trumpets sounding. Okay, so what I did was I just started looking through the Bible at stories related that had trumpets in them. Trumpets, people sounding trumpets. Uh, last week, we were looking at Exodus 19. And what you see here is a beautiful picture. You have the trumpet exceeding loud. You have God coming down in a thick cloud. Then the prophets all said the day of the Lord is coming. It is a day of trumpets. It is a day of thick cloud and darkness. And that's, that's repeated several times in the Old Testament. Um, the, you have an earth, a great massive earthquake here. The mountain is shaking and quaking. You have the voice of the trumpet sounding long. You have God calling Moses up and the people to come to meet with him on that day. And I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm going, that's a prophecy. It's not just a story in the Bible. It is a prophecy of what's going to happen. Same thing with Joshua. And I, I mentioned last week how Jericho represents Babylon the Great because Jericho fell. The walls of Jericho fell. In Jeremiah 51, the walls of Babylon are fallen. And so you see the connection there. Jericho represents Babylon the Great and her falling. And what you see here is the blowing and I always get people on this. How many trumpets did they blow? And people always say, seven. Nope, 13. One time a day for six days, seven times on the seventh day, 13 times. Okay, now, George, look in Revelation 17. Good to see you back, by the way. Revelation 17. Look at that chapter. What sticks out to you? What just jumps out of the page in Revelation 17? Mystery? Babylon the Great, right? All capital letters. Count the words. 13. Thank you, smarty. I did that at camp one year. The year I got saved, I actually went to camp two weeks in a row, and Dennis Teague was preaching. And the first week, I remembered, because facts always just stick in my head. He said, how many people, you know, are living in the world right now? This was 1975. And people, kids were guessing, and he said 3.7 billion people. That was 1975. So the next week at camp, I've already heard this. And he says, how many people, does anybody know how many people live in the world right now? And I said, 3.7 billion. I was nine years old. He said, smarty. It's like, how did you know that? <laughs> anyway, yeah, 13 words here. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Again, a connection showing you that Jericho is a foreshadowing, a type, an example, an example, an allegory. These are the words that the New Testament uses to describe how God draws these pictures in the Bible of what's going to happen. Um, so, I mean, and, and including, including, uh, in Joshua 6, 12, Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord and the seven priests bearing seven trumpets. Those priests represent the angels in Revelation 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, with trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets and the armed men went before them. But the rear reward, which means rearward, you have forward, 
and rearward. They're at the back of the battalion or the back of the, they're the, the back of the line. Um, the ark came after the ark of the Lord. The priests going on and blowing with trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once, returned into the camp. So they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, what? Shout. It's exactly what 1 Thessalonians 4 says. Shout. It's a day of, they're going to shout. Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout. For the Lord hath given you the city. So... It seems to me that the, our translation into heaven, they called rapture, marks the destruction of Babylon the Great. Because she is going to be destroyed. Amen? Amen to that. Now, turn to 2 Samuel. Boy, this is... And what happened last... I got home last night, and uh, we got home about 8 o'clock. We spent about... 30, 45 minutes unloading everything and getting stuff in the washing machine and putting stuff away and so on. You know how it is after a trip. Just once I'd like to take a trip and come home and not do anything. I don't know how that would work though. But anyway, in 2 Samuel, what, anyway, what I was saying was um, I was looking at my notes here last night. And I was thinking, you know, let me see what else the Bible says about trumpets. And the more I studied, the happier I got. And I mean, the scripture was just coming alive again. You just, I've already done this study. I've done it several times. I've preached this message numerous times. But, like you said, Brother George, you start reading the Bible again and you see things in there you never saw before. Words that are in the Bible that you're going, I didn't know that was in the Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 6. David wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And you remember in 1 Samuel, the Philistines stole it. Eli had it in the tabernacle at Shiloh. But the Philistines stole it. And after the Philistines, thousands of them died of what the Bible calls emeralds, which I think is, hang on, hemorrhoids. They were, it was a bloody issue is what it was. And they died of hemorrhoids. Okay? Because it, it, the blood would not stop. They, they literally bled out in their britches or whatever, in their skirts. And after all these thousands of people died, the Philistines said, we got to get rid of that thing. Whatever God is the God of this ark wants his ark back and we're going to send it back. So they put it on a cart and they took two mother cows that had just calved, and mama cows are like mama bears, they don't leave the young ones. And those cows, those two cows, the Bible says they went lowing, brrr, all the way to the territory, I think it was, uh, I can't remember who it was. But anyway, into Jewish territory. And that was showing you that God was moving those cows against their will. To bring that ark back. And it sat at a man's house for all of these years. From the time of Samuel to the time of David. Now David wants to bring it back. So the Jews have been without the ark. That, which means they cannot have their tabernacle service. They cannot have the uh, day of atonement. Because on that day the high priest would go in with the blood sprinkle it on the ark seven times for the atonement of sins for one year. They couldn't have that. They could not fulfill the law. It was God's throne. God was not present among the Israelites. He was gone, and they knew it. Uh, it represented God's mercy. It was called the mercy seat of God sitting on there, and that's, that was 
how God was going to forgive their sins. And so finally, David has it in his heart to bring it to Jerusalem. So the first time he attempts it, what did he do wrong? Does anybody know? He got it bad wrong. The ark, by the law, just like the um, chariot of God in Ezekiel 1, the chariot of God was carried by four angels called cherubim, the cherubs. Remember, they had the face of an eagle, the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion. That's the throne of God, how it was carried. That was the chariot of God. It had wheels and everything. And so God ordained that what's on earth must match what's in heaven. And so God ordained a pole went on two sides of the ark and four Levite priests carried the ark. The number four representing the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because it represents salvation. The only way for the, in the Old Testament to be saved was through the Ark of the Covenant. There was no other... Listen, you could not be saved without the Ark of the Covenant. There was no other way. And so four Levite priests have to carry this. That is God's way. God put it in the law and said that's how it should be done. It's not to be carried any other way lest ye die. So what did David do? He's not paying attention. He's not following the scriptures. People make mistakes. He orders that the ark be put on a cart and driven to Jerusalem. Not God's way. That would represent another gospel, a different way. And what happened on the way? The ox stumbled, the cart tipped, a man by the name of Uzzah reached out to steady the ark of the covenant. And what happened? He died instantly. And it was called Perez Uzzah, the breach of Uzzah. In other words, it was on its way. Uzzah died because they were not doing... Listen, when you have a different gospel, all you have is another way of dying and going to hell. That's what you have. You have a religious way of going to hell instead of a non-religious one. Because it's a false gospel. There's only... One way. Amen? So it's called the breach of Uzzah because the ark, again, stopped right there. Later on, David said, I think we ought to do this the right way. So he sends Levite priests out to carry the ark the way it was meant to be carried by four. So in 2 Samuel 6, 12, look at what happens when the ark comes back to the people of Israel. Now, think this way. What did the ark have in it? The two tables of stone, the law, right? Jesus was fashioned after the law, made after the law. He had the law in his inward parts. What else was in the ark? The manna, the pot of manna. Jesus was the bread sent down from heaven. What else was in there? Aaron's rod that budded. That is the rod of Jesse, of the seed of David, is Christ that buds from the rod. So what is the Ark of the Covenant in reality? It's Jesus Christ. So watch this. With that in mind, look at your Bible. And it was told King David saying that the Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they that bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. Remember how many times they marched around Jericho during the six days? One time a day. Six days. Six paces. Then... He sacrificed oxen and fatlings, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. Remember, and his wife, Michelle, despised him for that. Okay? And David was girded with the linen ephod, and David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the trumpet, or ark of the Lord, with what? Shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. There's another one for you. 
What does this spell out? I believe that it spells out the redemption, the salvation, and the covenant promised to Israel restored. Remember, this place where Uzzah reached out and touched the ark was called Perez Uzzah. The word Perez means a breach. Who is the repairer of the breach? Christ. He repairs all the breaches. God made a, the, the Israelites breached the old covenant. So God breached with them and said, you're not my people. But what's going to happen in the last days? God's going to restore to them and repair that breach, that division that is between the Jews. Everybody was looking at this Hebrew Bible this morning. Okay? It's all Old Testament. There's no New Testament here. So that means they're partially blinded. They can't see who Moses is, they can't see who the prophets are, they can't see what, the, what I just told you about the Ark of the Covenant, they don't understand the blood of the Lamb on the doorpost, they don't, they don't get that. They follow the rules, but they don't understand the meaning of them. And they're very, very lost. And one of these days, God is going to repair the breach, and He's going to bring uh, Him and His people back together again, and it's represented here, by the Ark of the Covenant coming into the city. Now they can have the Day of Atonement. Now their sins can be forgiven. Now God is going to restore everything to them. And uh, it comes in with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. So, when Paul said that, uh, Be not, beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened unto Israel till the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. To me, the fullness of the Gentiles then means the time when we are translated into heaven, raptured, taken out. Now, God is going to go back to his people whom he foreknew, whom he loved. Is God going to break a promise ever? No. If God made promises, he keeps them. And I just don't understand replacement theology that says God's done with Israel. God's done with dealing with them as a nation. They're not a people anymore and they never will be. That's not true. Because if God will break his promise to Israel, who are we? We're nobody. We're a people that were nobody that God did not know, a foolish people that God decided to give the gospel to. Here's another story. Judges. Mm, this is Gideon. All of the evil armies have come and encompassed the Israelites and they're going to destroy them. And poor Gideon. Every time you see Gideon, he's like, um, what's the word for it? Low self-esteem. Okay? Um... Um, he just, he's got to be told over and over and over again. Every time God showed him what he was going to, how he was going to use Gideon, Gideon said, well, show me a sign. Show me a sign. Remember, Gideon laid the fleece out before the Lord. God let him do that. And it came out exactly the way he said. And then Gideon said, well, let's double down on it. Let's do it again backwards. Then I'll know. So he did, God had patience with him and he did it. And so now God is telling, had told Gideon, you've got too many people in your army, you need to cull them out. And he got it down to 300 men. Gideon's like, how am I going to defeat these guys with 300 men? Can't be done. And God said, well, do it my way. So you have, give everybody a sword, give everybody a pitcher with a lamp in it. And at a certain time, they're going to break the lamps, shine the light and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, already in the camp, I can't remember what army this was. It was the Moabites or the Edomites or the Ammonites or one of them ites. Uh, one of the guys in the camp had a dream. And he saw a flying roll. He was at Lambert's cafeteria. He saw a flying roll. And the guys are sitting there going, well, what happened? He said, it flew into our camp. All the tents are destroyed. 
Bodies laying everywhere. It killed every one of us. And when he told the dream, somebody else sitting around that campfire said, is this not Gideon and his army? They figured it out. So they're already, these guys are already freaking out. God had stirred up fear and anxiety in them. And so the next night when they break all these pictures and see 300 lights surrounding them, they got to be thinking every light, there's got to be a million men behind that light. Man, we're dead. Okay. Did Gideon actually fight that battle? Nah, didn't bloody a sword. But look what happened. In, in verse 16, he divided the 300 men into three companies and put a trumpet in every man's hand. Here's the trumpets. With empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, look on me and do likewise. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now let's see what happens next. Verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him, remember he divided them up in threes came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets, break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled like little girls, amen, chasing them. All because of the sound of the trumpet. Okay? So another thing then that I see here is that the trumpets are announcing the wrath of God. They're announcing it. And actually, when the seventh trumpet, remember how like the sixth seal or the seventh seal brings in the seven trumpets, the seventh trumpet will bring in the seven vials of wrath. In 2 Samuel chapter 20, now there's an alternative, there's an alternate story line here. Because we not only are going to see the appearance of Christ in the air, and I believe the Bible, the Bible says, all eyes shall see him. And I remember watching Trinity Broadcast Network years ago and how Paul Crouch was blowing his own trumpet by, and trying to raise money by saying TBN is going to fulfill Bible prophecy because the Bible says that every eye shall see Jesus on that day. Well, that's not possible because the earth is round. If he appears somewhere, not everybody will see him. And he said, I believe that God has shown me that our cameras are going to broadcast Jesus appearing around the world. Now, we need your help to do this. We need a faith promise of $1,000 from each. I'm not, listen, those guys, they'll use anything in the Bible to get money out of your pocket. I read... One of Jimmy Baker's books after he got out of prison, and he admitted, he said, when we were rolling in the dough at the PTL club, he said, we never, as a team, sat and prayed and sought God about the messages that I was going to preach on the PTL club show. He said, we sat and figured out things that we could say to them that would get them to write checks and send us money, then we would go and dig out scriptures that backed us up on it. They were just wrestling, resting scripture, twisting it to make Jimmy Baker rich. And he's still doing it. But anyway, so we have the appearing of Christ, but we also have the appearing of another Christ, another Jesus. So 2 Thessalonians 2 says, And then shall that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So watch this, 2 Samuel 20. And there happened to be there a man of Belial, 
Belial has the name Bel in it. He's a child of the devil, a son of Belial. It's not just a curse word like we have now. This is, was identifying him. He's one of the tares in Matthew 13, children of the wicked one. And his name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. So what this man Sheba, a son of Belial, is declaring is that he's telling God and he's telling everybody that hears him, I will never have anything to do with God again. I don't want him in my life. I don't want to read his word. I don't believe a word of it. God's going to stay away from me. I'm done. And I'm going to do everything I can to destroy men's faith. That's essentially what he's saying. He is trying to get people on his side by saying, we have no part in David. Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. In other words, we're not going to heaven. And they declare this at the sound of a trumpet. Now, what happens is the trumpets are going to sound. We're going to be caught up in the air. And at that point, I do not believe God is going to offer salvation to another Gentile. I think he's done. I think the door of the ark gets shut. By the blowing of this trumpet, this man declares to the world, I have no part with these people. No part in David. Who's in David? Who's in David right now when he says this? Christ is. He's in his loins. So by declaring that, he's saying, I'm never going to be a Christian. Don't even ask me. Don't come... I told this story before, but it brought back the memory of the guy. I was trying to teach his daughter of what baptism meant. And uh, his wife went and got the dad. And the dad already didn't want anything to do with me. So I started witnessing to him very nicely. I wasn't coming down on him or anything like that. And I just asked him, I said, would you like... Like your daughter did, she's asked Jesus in your heart, would you like to be forgiven of your sins? He said, I know where your church is. And he said, if I wanted to hear a sermon, I would come to your church. Other than that, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with your church. If I ever change my mind, I'll come to your church. But right now, I don't want nothing to do with it. And that visit was over. That moment, it was done. That was his house. He has a right. We walked out, me and Kevin Pogue, and we kicked the dust off our shoes and Ichabod. So I think that's part of this. Uh, 2 Kings 11, here's another one. Now we have a woman named Atalia. She is a picture of Mystery Babylon. She's a she. She's a mother of harlots and abominations. And she is opposed to Jesus. She's opposed to God. She's opposed, watch this, she's opposed to the king of the Jews. 2 Kings eleven thirteen. 13, when Italia heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manor was, and the princes and the trumpeters by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew with trumpets. Now watch what happens. And Italia rent her, if I remember right, Italia is the mother of this king. Or maybe an, another one, maybe I've got it confused. But anyway, Italia rent her clothes, and cried, treason, treason. Because she had some, I think what it was is that she had her son that she wanted to be the king. I think that's what it was. 
You look that up. You study that out. And because he didn't get picked, why, she ain't going along with it. Sounds like some business meetings I've been in. But Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the host, and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges. In other words, get her out of my sight. And him that followeth her, kill with the sword. Now in Revelation 19, when Jesus comes down from heaven, what's coming out of his mouth? Sharp, two-edged sword. And with it, he destroys the godless armies of the beast. Uh, kill with the sword. So anybody that is on her side in thinking that we got the wrong king, because when Christ comes, it is a battle of two kings. The king of kings and lord of lords and the, the beast, the antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who says, I am God. So now we've got the two of them. Just like, it's like a movie buildup. You watch a movie, you get introduced to the good guy. Then you get introduced to like Darth Vader, the bad guy. Or, you know, whoever. Okay, you got John Wayne over here and you got Billy the Kid over here or something like that. And as the movie climaxes, you know there's going to be a shootout at the end of the movie between those two fellas. Okay, one of them wearing white, one of them wearing black. That's how they did it. Same thing here, Revelation 19, there's a showdown between these two guys right here. And it's not even, it's, it's not even a fight. The beast has already lost. He lost some 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary. Amen. For the priest had said, let her not be slain in the house of the Lord. And they laid hands on her and she went out by the way by the which the horses came into the king's house and there was she slain. Right in a pile of horse apples. Amen? Where she belongs. Second Chronicles 13. What? Who's going to ring the bell? Maybe it ain't time yet. If I watch this, I'll start reading it and, she'll, and my wife will ring it. 2 Chronicles 13, Behold, God himself is with us for our captain and his priest with sounding trumpets to cry alarm against you. Look at, look at this. O children of Israel, fight ye not against the Lord God of your fathers, for ye shall not prosper. Now, this is the story where Jeroboam, he's the king of the ten northern tribes of Israel. And then we have, this would be, who was it, Rehoboam, who was king of Judah. The, the, the nation has split and the, the Israelites from Samaria are coming down to destroy Judah and Benjamin. And so, in verse 13, Jeroboam caused an ambushment to come about behind them. So they were before Judah, and the ambushment was behind them. You understand what, what's happening here? Here's Judah, the armies of Judah, and Jeroboam's armies are at their forward position, the front... But they also came around the back and cut them off so that they could not retreat. That's what the, if you study World War II, that's what the Battle of the Bulge was. That was a deliberate intent by, um, who was it? It wasn't MacArthur. It was Eisenhower and um, Patton. And, um, oh, I can't remember the other general. He was from Missouri. But anyway... They, got, they let the Germans in through the middle of France. And the Allies had the north of France and the south of France, and they let the Germans come through, and the plan was to come around behind them and cut them off. Now, it took a while because the weather was bad. The Allies couldn't get any supplies. They were, hunk they were hunkered down. They were digging holes in frozen ground, laying in snow, and when the Germans got arrogant, they sent a note to the commanding officer of the troops there in that bulge area and asking them, we will allow you time to surrender yourself. We will give you such and such hours to surrender. Will you surrender? And whoever was commanding the army wrote the word nuts with an exclamation point and they sent it back. 
And the Germans are going, Was ist dies? Was ist nuts? They had no idea what he meant. Okay? So they're going, Is that retreat? I don't know. But it worked. They got cut off. And they all had to surrender. It worked. So this is what's happening here. Jeroboam's got them. And listen. God will let this happen to you. He did it to Israel when they first left Egypt. First place that they went was to the Red Sea, and they could go no further. And then God went and got Pharaoh in their rear position and cut them off from escaping out of there. There's one road in and one road out, and that's it. And God put them in a trap. I'm going to preach on um, temptation and repentance. I won't get to the repentance part this morning. But I, after studying this thing out, God, there's two definitions of the word temptation. One is like what the devil does, to tempt us to sin, to disobey God. The other definition of it is a trial. And God will not tempt men to sin, but he will try our faith. That's assured. He did it with Abraham when he asked him, bring thy son, thine only son, and offer him for a burnt offering. That was a test. And we will go through temptations in that manner. And the armies of the enemy will come this way and they will come this way and they will close us in and then God will say to us, what are you going to do now? Who else do you have to turn to? The woman with the issue of blood spent all of her money on doctors and everything else. She found no healing. God was not angry at her for doing that. God just simply made sure that she had no other choice but to go to the Savior. And I tell you what, I've been there. And if you'll be honest, you have too. Where God closed you in with your worst enemies and said, what are you going to do now? Are you going to give up? Are you going to just go back to the way it was? Go back to living the way you were? Or will you call out to me? And so... Look at this, verse 14. When Judah looked back, behold, the battle was before and behind. And think about it. Think about that statement. Not only do I worry about things that could happen, I often worry about things that have already happened in the past. And I don't have any control over any of them, do I? Not one. The battle is always going to be before and behind. But it came to pass that the men of Judah and the priests, wait a minute, they cried unto the Lord. That's what you should do. The priests sounded with the trumpets and the men of Judah gave a shout. Amen. And they all got raptured. Amen. The men of Judah shouted. They came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah and God delivered them into their hand. Their enemies. And Abijah and his people slew them with a great slaughter. And Watch this. If you don't believe the Bible, you won't believe this. They slew 500,000 men in one day. That's a lot of blood and guts. That is a lot. That's more probably than could be buried. And so it brings to mind these prophecies where... God said, I'm going, to bring, I'm going to call in the fowl of the air and the beasts of the field, and they're going to come, and you're going to basically end up as dung in the field because they're going to come and have a meal on you. That's what God's going to do to your enemies. Amen? But you've got to cry unto the Lord. You've got to do it God's way. Father, bless your word. Thank you, Lord, for opening our eyes to this. What a beautiful things that we behold in these mighty words. 
Lord, bless the message this morning. Bless our worship service. We thank you, God, for all that you've done for us. And thank you for this book. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.